efficiency of work, but also the, the actors themselves. And I had this uh, uh, colorized version that came up. And then I was going to give you a little picture uh, with these uh, body casts and, and tell a little story about, the, uh, about photography in Pompeii. But I, I, I couldn't compete with what, uh, what you did yesterday, Matt. So uh, I'm going to change and start with a different conceit. Um, and that is one that I've stolen from another place which is another area of my uh, academic life, which is I run a, a program for the consortium of five institutions that surround mine, and, uh, including uh, the University of Massachusetts Amherst, called the Five Colleges Program in Blended Learning and Digital Humanities. And so I'm often asked uh, to talk about digital humanities, what they are, and what we are supposed to be doing, and I have often found myself revealing who I am which will inf impact how I talk about things today in the format of asking, is digital humanities, or in our case, digital archaeology, and it works better with humanities uh, in this way, but do you use the word is or do you use the word are when you talk about digital humanities, digital archaeologies? Is suggests a discipline of its own right with its theories, its methods, its own disciplinary history. Or are we talking about digital archaeologies, digital humanities, which is a series of practices, a series of tools and methods that can be ported and moved across different, discip uh, different disciplines and different sets of activities. Now, I would say that I'm definitely one of these uh, people who falls in the latter category of di digital humanities, digital archaeologies are. I find myself to be very happy to have been someone who's tried to kind of throw spaghetti against the wall, the digital spaghetti against the, the digital frame, and see what sticks in terms of archaeological practice for me. And why I wanted to kind of reframe some of these conversations after what we were, were delighted to be presented with yesterday is that I think it comes across a bit too positivistically, a bit a, a little un, uh, uncareful, uh, incautious. So uh, I wanted to bring this up as a way to kind of frame my own way of thinking about these things, my own experiences, and then to tell you a little bit about these projects that I work on. I also think it's useful uh, as a, just, a, just as a beginning point for each of us to think how do we approach these topics and are we an is or an are? Uh, and what this also becomes for me and maybe for you is that if you are an is or an are, this challenges me to be more of an is. It challenges me to understand the weakness in my expertise, the weakness in my, in my interests, is that I don't think enough about the things particularly we heard yesterday. So uh, what I want to do is present to you a couple of uh, case studies, of three kind of stories of archaeological practice that comes from my own uh, experiences. As I was just trying to say, you know, it's, 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 uh, it's not necessarily a recommendation for best practices, although I do think some of the things we've done have been successful. Um, it's kind of digital, uh, digital archaeology that is neither a love story nor a lament. It's, it's a, series of expectation, or a series of experiences that I've had that I want to show you, and I think that, that this is particularly an audience uh, that I can learn from hear some comments back, and perhaps I'm going to resonate with some of you and, and, and jog loose some new ideas. So the, uh, the three things that we're going to hear about today uh, are a project I ran from 2010 to 2014 in the field in Pompeii, co-directed with a person called Stephen Ellis at the University of Cincinnati. Stephen is my long-term colleague, uh, my best friend, and since 1998 when we first met in Pompeii, and he's going to be all over this talk because we've been collaborating on so many things. So if I just say Stephen, and I want to call out and give him credit as, as, uh, as a, a key partner in all this, you'll know who I'm talking about. So the first of these is the, a project called the Pompeii uh, Quadroporticus Project. Um, the, uh, the other two I'm going to talk about are projects, two digital platforms at Pompeii, and a, a third project, a new excavation, again uh, directed in this case by Stephen, uh, in which I'm the assistant director, at a site called Tharos. Now, the part of my talk that I think is the value-added component to not just giving you what I did on my summer vacation over the last 20 years, uh, is that I've begun to reflect uh, both kind of after the fact at some of the practices and some of the ramifications for the organization of human beings and their labor on site. Uh, 
human beings and their labor off-site in digital uh, work that is not necessarily in, in the field, and then to be ex exceedingly explicit about it in terms of moving into this most recent project. Uh, and so first, I'll tell you a little bit about, about this project. So uh, I don't think we need to situate Pompeii probably too much for this audience, but nonetheless, uh, I show you here that uh, Pompeii is located in the Bay of Naples. And I also put up this slide because I'm going to use it again to show you where Tharos is if you're not familiar with that site. So the Pompeii Quadroporticus project, as I just mentioned, was co-directed by myself and Stephen Ellis at the University of Cincinnati from 2010 to 2014, 2013 um, in the field. And we were interested in creating a project that looked closely at this large and la long neglected building in Pompeii. This project was intended to look at, am I not? This is the first time in my life I'm not loud enough. Um, it, it was intended to look at uh, the, a building that had been excavated in the 1760s. And we began, as, as this project, as this, this slide shows you, in 2010. This building had been around a very long time. But it had had a explanation. People thought of it as what was called the barracks of the gladiators. We were unsatisfied with that, uh, that kind of functional definition. We had an excavation, and Stephen was directing that, right next door. And we thought, well, this doesn't seem to add up. And one day, in excavating, well, of course it wasn't a day, but one season, we were excavating, and we found that there was a drain, a big massive drain, and this is a meter wide, running from this area down into this area. So coming under this wall, which is a modern wall reconstructed here, and running underneath the building here. It's a drain that helps go from, uh, that helps uh, sluice the water away from the covered theater here in Pompeii, the otherwise known as the Odeon or Teatrum Tectum, uh, and then move that water into the area here of the Quadroporticus. Now again, Matt has st stolen my thunder, and then done it with, with better, uh, better imagery and, and, and better thought, of this was an accidental find. We found that this drain is running underneath this building, but it's a problem because the building is supposed to be considerably older than the drain it's destroying. So if we have a building that was built in, the eight, in, uh, in perhaps 78 BCE, running with its drain to be destroyed by a building that was built in 130 BCE? Well, we discovered that we had something that we began to call an M.C. Escher problem. This is a point at which the archaeology leads you up a set of, uh, of experiences and understandings that push you through time, and when you get to the far end of that temporal evidence, you find yourself back at the beginning or even earlier than it. Now, this is both discomforting in the sense that one does not like to find out that their archaeological research leads to impossible temporal probabilities, um, but it also provides a necessary test on the moment. And we began to realize from this kind of Escher problem that this, po that this building in Pompeii had a far more complex structural history. And so like Matt's uh, story of the, uh, of the arrowhead, we have a big drain and it led to an unexpected conclusion, which led into an entirely new research project. Now, I told you before that the uh, Quadroporticus was called the Gladiator Barracks, and, and, and although we were unhappy with that appellation, we weren't totally uh, rejecting it outright, because there were some underpinnings of evidence that were supporting this. For example, there were wall paintings painted on the wall showing gladiatorial armaments, there were gladiatorial armaments in physical form, helmets, greaves, um, no weapons, um, but, uh, but shoulder epaulettes, and other forms of, uh, of uh, gladiatorial armaments that suggested that people who would wear them might be in the area. And there were a number of pieces of gladiatorial uh, inscriptions and graffiti found inside the building early on as well. But something interesting also happened. Um, which is once a hundred years or more of the building's life as an archaeological ruin rather than a piece of the past had transpired, much of that wall painting had fallen off. And now the bare masonry and the structural history of the building was available to be read, to be able to be studied. 
And so as we then had this problem of this MC Escher issue, we then had this opportunity to go to Pompeii, to go to the Quadraporticus, and study each of the walls, to study its individual history, and to aggregate that up into a story that told about the lifespan of this building between its origins in about 130 BCE and its destruction in 79 CE. We were always explicit about one other thing of our project, which is we have an excavation next door and we want to use the evidence from that project. But what we're not going to do is we're not going to excavate ourselves. We want to see how far non-invasive methodologies, masonry analysis, which I'm going to talk about in a second, and many digital technologies for capturing and recording the space uh, and the, uh, the, the kind of uh, descriptive texture of the building could be done without digging. How far can we actually push non-invasive methods and non-invasive techniques to tell a story? Can we then borrow things from other excavations? And what, is, what are the kind of limits of these, uh, of these uh, well, at that point, pieces of rhetoric about what you can do with non-invasive techniques? Rhetoric for us. Um, this uh, is a, a wall from the uh, Quadraporticus, uh, and I use it just to tell you just the briefest things about our, our techniques. Um, in masonry analysis, what we try to do is we look at the styles of construction, we look at the materials and their arrangement uh, inside, the, inside of a wall, and we look at the mortars in careful uh, consideration to see if we can describe and distinguish individual elements of construction within a single wall. And now, if you, it's, it's a maybe a little harder to see from where you are, but if you can, you might notice an arch embedded inside this wall. And surely you can't see from where you are, because I can hardly see it from here, uh, and I'm sorry about that. Um, you might see yet the origin and springing of yet another arch here. So what you can't tell from the framing of my photo, my photo here is that we're on the edge of a large stairway going up. If I pair this image, however, with a drawing by Mazua from about 1804, uh, you can see this picture kind of on the opposite side now uh, with the stairway leading up. Um, and we can see that these few remnants of this archway gives us an opportunity to think about what, how we might reconstruct this entire stairway leading up to the uh, area, uh, the area above, which is uh, the Temple of Minerva. So this is a small glimpse of the kinds of things that this method, this non-invasive method, is meant to, uh, meant to uh, teach us. Um, I just want to linger on this for a moment because I remember, um, uh, let's see, there we go. I remember yesterday seeing uh, some images in uh, uh, Jana and uh, Vladislav's poster of floor fragments, and it reminded me to show you this photo, which is how we study and why studying mortar can be really important in this type of analysis as well, which is this is a piece of mortar flaked off from one of the walls in Pompeii. And as it degraded over the years, it looks like a gray, lumpy mess. You can see some things in it. But once you flip it over, you begin to realize how specific and how almost like a fingerprint different recipes for mortar, different uh, constructions of mortar can be. It can be very, very useful for determining the, the story of a building, or at least distinguishing between different events, even if they're made in the same construction style. So the other thing I just wanted to, oops, one more. The other thing I wanted to do is just, just highlight that in our project, we use lots and lots of digital technologies. We use laser scanning. We used, of course, photogrammetry. We used ground penetrating radar. And of course, we used lots and lots of just simple, good old fashioned digital uh, photography. Now, the biggest and most important thing that we did is that in 2010 was this is the year the iPad came out. And we were very much technophilic and very much solutionist and very much driving forward with this notion that there's an unalloyed good to using technology in uh, these efficient means. And the iPad was certainly the most important tool that we had to use on the project. And so I'll tell, I'll tell the, the things that we did most were um, we used them to have a custom database that allowed the students and the, the staff to enter the information in structured ways that allowed us to get comp uh, compre comprehensive and comparative information. And it allowed us to take the photographs that we had with a digital camera, import them, and then draw over them in ways that allowed us to link what we had in the database to what we had in the imagery. 
This was really important for us because it allowed us, as we discovered over the years, to get better with this, to work very efficiently. Compared to our colleagues in uh, the excavation, and of course these are very radically different forms of work, um, we, were, we were working to, and again, this is such a kind of a terrible metric in certain ways, we were working to produce perhaps four times as many stratigraphic units being recorded as we were seeing out of the trenches. And again, that's a weird comparison to make in a certain way, but for us, it was a kind of way to, to benchmark what we were doing and how well we were working. And beyond the kind of comparison with other things, we became aware of the fact that we were getting further down the road than we thought we were. We were finding that we had more time to work on things. And I'm gonna talk now in just a moment about what we did with that efficiency. But I wanna linger for a moment. I added this slide because I really liked the two, two of the things that, that Jeremy said yesterday about portability uh, and about ripple effects. And I think that many of the things we'll talk about, I think just are constantly rippling effects throughout. Sometimes we can be more cognizant, maybe try to ride one of those waves a little bit. But here in portability, I think maybe one of the most interesting things is that at the same time as the iPad came out, the App Store came out. And early on, there were tens of thousands, and soon 100,000, and now well into the hundreds of thousands of applications out there available on the web. What I find fascinating about this is that we've always borrowed our tools. We've always taken from our physical tools, from the construction industry and from other industry, the building trades. We've taken our, many of our methods uh, from other, other disciplines and many of our theories from other disciplines. But suddenly there was this new world in which people were building tons and tons of things for us. And the vast majority of the things that we wanted to get from the internet, from these apps, were available. And when we didn't find them, in this new heady day of the App Store, many of these companies were willing to talk to us and say, well, what do you want it to do? How would you like it to work? And we worked with a company at that time called iDraw, it's now called Graphic, and they were really responsive, and they began to create features and roll them out that basically took a year for some of the more co complex things, but the next year, we had them. So there was a great give and take with the, with the tool at that time. And I, I'm struck by, to instruct to share with you two things. One is, imagine if there was a equally verbose and equally responsive physical industry for archeological tools. I think about if, if people were making Swiss Army tools because there was a marketplace of a whole range of uses for these physical tools. It's almost inconceivable to think about in, that, in those frameworks but I think it's useful then to compare that with what the digital world provided at that moment. The other thing that we should then do is, is, be, is be cognizant about what the lesson of the portability was, which is that once we have these tools available and we think, wow, it's free, it gives me 80% of the things I want, but those other 20%, I'm gonna have to find a way to live with that. That other 20% doesn't just become a, oh well, I didn't get to do that. It becomes part of the process. It becomes a new way of doing work that excludes a set of practices that you wanted to do. So just like photography, the app becomes a way of framing the work and the labor of the archeologist. So what did we do with this efficiency? Well, we discovered that we had this wonderful colonnade in the ancient uh, building. And of course, we knew it was there, but we didn't see it in quite the same way. We didn't see each column as, as information rich as we should have. And it didn't take too long for us to begin to see that these columns had a bunch of considerable different parts to them. And in many cases, the thing that we saw uh, very clearly was that they had large holes knocked into these columns. So we then began to do a study. We just decided to take in great detail to measure these, these objects. We measured every single, the height of every column drum talk about whether there was any metrologies we might understand them by, because both the Romans and the pre-Roman peoples, the Oscans, had different linear measurements to their foot. We did the same with the height of the fluting, which is a, a plaster jacket around the outside of the column. We found and documented the areas of uh, plaster that remained on the column outside of the jacket. And we documented these little interventions, which is what we called them because we couldn't always call them holes, we couldn't always call them cuttings. We had to come up with this abstract word, interventions. 
uh, into the columns. And finally, we found locations where the columns had been damaged, either in ancient times or in modern times. Um, and to do, in doing this, we ended up adding 1,700 more observations to our database. We came up with this massive bit of new information. And so what does this digital opportunity reflect? It reflects an opportunity for us to not only buy some time, but to more carefully and closely examine a, ob an object that we had been overlooking because we just hadn't thought that hard about it and it wasn't part of our training to study as something other than a, let's talk about the molding type of our Doric columns. It also then became a moment not just to talk about developing a, uh, a field method for recording these objects, but also a way of developing a technical method for developing and recording these objects. So what we did is we you know, took an iPad form, we had a space for pictures, we gave each column a number, we gave each drum a number, we gave each intervention a number and a type, uh, and then we did things like, well, let's talk about its position. Well, how do you tell where a hole on a column is? Well, we decided to use the good old-fashioned clock face. Uh, so this, this happens to be here at 6 o'clock. And then we measured the bottom of the cutting, uh, the top of the intervention from here, gave it a number, and then, oops, there's the bottom there, and then the top here. And it gave us a position on each column. To then talk about whether or not that hole meant anything, we wanted to see if it meant anything in relationship to another column. So we built a yet another form that allowed us to compare the data we'd collected from one column to another and, set, and look for matches. So here we have in column three, which is just south of column two, uh, we have a hole at position 12 at the following height. And over here we can scroll down all the information that comes from column three and find one at six o'clock that faces it at roughly the same height here. So we ended up building a way for us to not only to collect this information, but a way for us to begin to, the, to analyze it and make comparative information from it. The result, though, quickly, is that we ended up making a literal column graph, right? These are, this is blue, green, and red information uh, on the columns here, and I won't belabor what it means overall. But what I will tell you is that there are hundreds of interventions on these columns, and many of them facing between the colonnades. The, in the, the simple work of doing this made what was clearly to us a very permeable form of architecture much less permeable. That there were fences, there were cuttings for, for statues and statue bases between these columns, and we were suddenly facing the reality that our building was much more structured in the form of movement that could pass through it than we had once thought. Down here you see some cuttings that show that in this very middle intercolumniation, the 11th space in the very middle, there was what looks like evidence for a frame in between because there's no evidence for, a, um, uh, no evidence for things running between. And instead we might have a formalized doorway entering into this space. And that was a fascinating revelation of, and a new way of thinking about how this seemingly understood form of architecture, the column and the colonnade, how it was functioning in our ancient building. So, this is the, this is the happy story of the power of, uh, of efficiency. I want to move now quickly to two other projects. I want to move off of the world for a moment, out of the field, and into the classroom, into the library, and into the digital humanities lab, and talk about two projects that I've run uh, called the Pompeii Bibliography and Mapping Project, and now the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project. Um, just to begin, I want to very, uh, very uh, explicitly thank the National Endowment for the Humanities, the American Council of Learned Societies, my institution, UMass, the five colleges, uh, and now the Getty Foundation for massive amounts of support uh, of these projects. Um, because without their, without their willingness to support them financially, we wouldn't be able to do this, this work or talk about the labor I want to talk about. So super quickly, what are these projects? Well, the first, the digital, uh, the bibliography and mapping project is, as it sounds, a project in which we take a map of Pompeii, we digitize it, we make elements within that map, 
information rich. We make them clickable so that you can see you can click on the amphitheater, get some basic information from that. Married to this, although I had wanted to deeply integrate it, we haven't done that yet, but married to this, partnered with it, is a uh, online bibliography. So if we have a vast landscape of, of uh, space, we also have a vast landscape of, of citations, 23,000 citations about Pompeii. So please, if you're doing a thesis and you want to do an exhaustive study of uh, the bibliography of Pompeii, begin your despair now. Um, and then also, we've linked to online resources, the most important and powerful of which is, a, is called Pompeii in Pictures. And when I want to, I want to pause for a moment. I hadn't even thought of this till just now, but I'm always so impressed by this site and the people who put it together. Their names are Bob and Jackie Dunn. They are uh, a group of, they are two retired people who have spent the last 15 years of their retirement traveling from uh, Australia and now from the UK. They've returned home to the UK um, to take pictures of Pompeii, not because they're scientists necessarily, although by default I will say that they are, but because this is their love. They spend their extra time doing this scientific work. And because of them, we have literally tens of thousands of images on Pompeii. And I, as a, as a supposed scholar, as a cre credentialed scholar, can come around and grab their link and stick it into one of the buildings I've built, one of the polygons from the buildings I've built, and deeply enrich the work, uh, the, the, the site that I want to have to, to show things for, for Pompeii. Now, Pompeii has a huge scale. I see that I'm getting behind on my time, so I'm going to speed up a little bit here. Um, it has 640,000 square meters. There, it's divided into nine regions. There's at least 111 insulae that have been uh, city blocks that have been dug out now that reveal 1,100 individual buildings. You couldn't really call them like single-family homes when we call them buildings, but but there's a lot of individual units. Those break down into more than 10,000 individual rooms. There's 86,000 faces of walls inside the city. And from Pompeii pictures, we have 140,000 images of the city. This is some serious data. So if this is the kind of the point that the Pompeii uh, Bibliography and Mapping Project stopped, where we be pick up with the, the PALP, uh, the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project, is to begin to increase the spatial resolution away from the individual building and down to the individual building and down to the individual room and down even to the individual wall that you see here. So what you're looking at is, is a series of rooms uh, uh, symbolized and colored uh, based on the size of their area. Oops, I've jumped ahead. Um, ooh, that's, too, that's too pretty to, to jump ahead to. Um, uh, where we now have an individual tiny segment that goes uh, to just a segment of wall that's individual, that's going to allow me to do things, like realize that the vast majority of these 86,000 walls were painted in some ways. And many of them in really vibrant and interesting ways. This gives us an entire artistic landscape. It shows us that, and, and just remember, unlike photography, that none of these things are photographs. We can't talk about these things as being real. We can talk about them being imagined. So one of the powerful metaphors for me, the powerful uh, ways of thinking about this, is that this is a continuous surface in, in the order of hundreds of thousands of square meters of the Roman imagination. Everything here has been imagined. And now we have an opportunity to study that. And my goal is to deeply describe each of these to the degree that I can in the time and the, and the resources I have uh, in linked open formats so that that landscape is realized in ways that is not just interesting as a story like I've just told you in 30 seconds, but something that people can actually dig into. Um, what do we want to be able to do? We want to be able to do things like allow people very basically to find out that there are pictures of Hercules and search for Hercules and then find lots of more pictures of Hercules like you see here. And then because Hercules here as the child, and then Hercules here, perhaps perhaps if we're right in the interpretation, uh, finding himself the apples of Hesperides. Perhaps you as a scholar will suddenly realize, you know what, I don't really like Hercules. He's not a very woke dude. Uh, a lot of the stories about him are pretty bad. I'm actually much more interested in fruit. Although that's a silly translation or transition, it 
is useful to exemplify the idea that if we are able to put both apples and Hercules in the same picture, where we can allow people to make novel connections and to move efficiently and easily from being interested in one thing, a category of demigod, to a category of plant life, and to do that with, without missing a beat. So our idea is to, to move that uh, into the hands of people very soon. Why do we want to do this? Two reasons. Uh, Pompeii is still threatened, right? This happens to be a forest fire on the face of a mountain. But when seen from inside the city, it's really quite terrifying. And it reminds you that this is a site under threat. There are other types of threats, like tourism. We actually call this the pyrotouristic surge. Um, hundreds of uh, thousands of people coming down the street all at once, compressed into these small spaces. Um, and they provide an opportunity to realize that this artistic landscape is under threat. But let me reposition that slightly and tell you that this also suggests these hundreds of thousands of people, and Superintendent of Pompeii told me this summer that over four million people are now coming to Pompeii each year. It also suggests that there is an appetite for information about Pompeii. And so this artistic landscape project isn't going to be, it won't probably be primarily a scholarly and academic resource. It will probably, just by sheer numbers, be a public resource. And that will be very interesting. But let's pivot back now to, uh, to the work that we need to do to make these kinds of projects happen. And that we have to understand that tools are shaping the way that we do this work. So I just uh, have an iPad with a student taking a picture of an iPad is the most efficient way for us to, uh, to record which column drum we were talking about at a moment. But um, I just found that a cute, cute image. So what do, I, what do we have to do to run projects like the PVMP and PAL? What do we have to do in order to, to make the labor that's going to be required uh, uh, actually transpire? Well, a year, about a year and a half ago, two years ago now, I taught a first year introductory seminar for, for uh, entering students at Pompeii, entering students at UMass uh, called Digital Tools in the Academy. And it was just a way for me to tell students, hey, here's a whole bunch of things that you are probably going to encounter as you, are, as you matriculate to the school and of course across your, your um, career here at UMass. And I asked them some simple things, just gave them a little survey before early on. And I said, you know, how do you rate these, how do you rate your understanding of these technologies? And I showed them the Google Suite. And for those of you who can't, can't see what these things say, the scale went from, uh, uh, huh, I know it's a thing, used it once, use it almost daily, and I develop for it. Here's Google Docs. Everybody uses it almost daily, almost everyone uses it almost daily. Google Sheets, quite a bit of use across it, only a few people don't know what we're talking about. Slides are pretty common. Now we get to Google Forms and some of the newer things like Google Drawings, they're not nearly as, as interesting. But look at the, look at the reliance on these technologies for incoming students. And then despair when you realize that the same, the same scale applied to do you do, how, what do you know about library searches with the online library catalog? People are like, huh? So these are introductory students. I don't blame them at all. I am saying that they're, they're stupid or bad. But what I am saying is I have to, if I'm a professor and particularly an employee work, an employer for a digital project, I have to understand something of the digital literacy of the people I'm working with. And the impact of this is that when we turn to the labor that goes into making the Pompeii bibliography and mapping the Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project, we're in the Google Suite that I am building templates and workspaces, and this is just called Workspace One, in which the work that the student will do will be in a format and in a place that's familiar to them. It's a way for me to distribute the work individually and to build tools and, and uh, instructions for the students. So I'm not going to go into this too much, but I will point out that to do this kind of work, to build these kind of, uh, of projects, I have to figure out how to make uh, infrastructures that are simple enough for undergraduates to do really complex work in. So that means I have to help. I have help files like one of these books that they're going to be deconstructing with color coding that matches the fields in which this information is supposed to go. 
I have deeply annotated sets of uh, also co equally color coded and coded to the same fields and uh, in workspaces uh, in, in terms of instructions. And I even have made uh, a 47 minute long tutorial video linked to the same document that allows students to hopefully, God forbid, watch it fully through more than once but to go back and get a little bit of help uh, at their own pace and in their own way to understand what we're trying to do. Um, but there's one other thing I want to talk about with this subject before I move on quickly to Tharos, which is I want to just say that if we're successful, if we're able to pr reduce the resolution down to the individual wall, attach an artwork to it, and then say, hey, show me the fact that this wall knows not only where it is in space, but it also knows what room it's in, which means it can know what faces it across the wall and what other kinds of things are in the room with it. If we're successful, there are things that might have knock-on effects, some of these ripple effects. And I've talked about this in, in another paper, but these are two people who've run the Pompeii Archaeological Research Project Porta Stabia, again run by Stephen Ellis. Uh, this is Professor Kevin Dykus and Professor uh, uh, Allison Emerson. You see them at work with their iPads in the field. Now if I'm successful and I can deliver to people working, to, to people in the world, but especially to archaeologists working in the field, tens of, uh, tens of thousands of citations and bibliographic information that link out eventually to full text resources, if I can give them the opportunity to see the bibliography and the artworks of the spaces that are in theirs or like theirs from somewhere else in Pompeii, we have to wonder where the time and the labor to do that investigative, what we would call secondary source work, where that's going to fit in this time. Because we see that we're not digging now if they're doing this work. It's important. It's necessary academic labor that needs to go into the production of archaeological knowledge. But is it a good thing that I'm producing the opportunity to compete for their time here? Because if we know anything about working in the field, it's particularly the middle management, the archaeological supervisors, who get squeezed. And it's their time at the dinner table, their time at the, at the, at the cafe, when everyone else is out having a drink, that they're back filling out context sheets, fi figuring out how to store their, uh, their, their photographs and things like this, um, that is going to matter. So we have yet a challenge to figure out how to deal with these kinds of resources that people like me are trying to provide and how to manage that in the field. What is what I've called the library fieldwork divide and is dissolving it going to be in the, in the end a net positive? Now, the last place I want to talk to you about is Tharos. Um, it is uh, the Tharos Archaeological Research Project directed by Stephen Ellis. I'm the assistant director and uh, if you don't know where Tharos is, uh, it's here on the island of Sardinia. Um, it is in the uh, area of the Bay of Oristano, uh, on the peninsula here you see, and hopefully this is going to play. Uh, this is our little introduction to the site. This is what Tharos looks like. Um, it's a long scale, long lived site. It goes back to the Bronze Age with the Nuragic culture. They have Phoenician burials that were then followed by the Punic uh, uh, Carthaginians who inhabited the site for centuries up until the Romans came early on in the, uh, uh, in the Republic in terms of imperial uh, expansions um, and then became a Roman site finally falling out of uh, specific history sometime in the early medieval period, uh, maybe even late antiquity, we're not sure. And yes, we have a, a trailer for our uh, archaeological project. Um, that was not just to show a sexy video, although it also was to do that. Uh, it was also to point out the degree to which drones are impacting our work. Now, one of the things we had to do when we showed up was know where we are, deal with it, and, and, and understand the space, because we were spoiled as Pompeian archaeologists coming to, to Tharos and having a landscape that had already been divided up. There was already a system of nomenclature. There was always an, an address system that allowed us to, to drill down through that level of resolution. But this archaeological site didn't have that. So with drone photography and GIS, we were able to begin to replicate some of that. We drew regions at, at uh, Tharos. We drew roads. 
we drew individual areas of excavation and we called them areas. And we divided the site up into zones that were unexcavated. And all of this gave us an opportunity to say, we know where we are. We divided and, and named space in order to give us a nomenclature and a way to talk about a place we were unfamiliar with. It also gave us a really important map of who owned what areas of the city because other uh, scholars had concessions for excavation and knowing where our rights were and their rights were was an important piece of information to share with our team to be respectful of the ways in which we need to work in the site that is not ours. None of these sites are ours, but sharing them is important. Now, of course, resolution is important, right? As we drill down from our, uh, our, our, our drone images, we're able to get from these, these well-organized ortho mosaics um, images that were down to about a pic uh, center and a centimeter and a third in a pixel, right? You can see the nails in the boards of the boardwalks above the sewers here. And speaking of sewers, even working from just the drone, before we showed up on site for our first year of excavation, we were able to map some of the sewers and some of the cisterns. We are able to draw some of the walls of the city. This was great because it then gave us an opportunity to say once we move into our areas of excavation, which you see in these two spots, it allowed us to say, okay, we already have some handle on what we're doing. We begin to understand the space by trying to map it and draw it. Um, we had two excavation areas this last summer, 2019, uh, up in the north, an unexcavated area of, uh, uh, of the site that had, been still the, had still the abandonment layers, and then a shop down in the southern section of the site. Now, if I, even though I don't have time now and I'm already beginning to run over, uh, I would talk about some of the novel, important ways that people like uh, a PhD student Chris Motts at the University of Cincinnati and uh, Dr. Lee Lieberman, currently the head of DH at, at the Claremont Colleges, have done in implementing a workflow and a data flow for objects with the idea of saying that objects themselves and object specialists are largely segregated and excluded from the process of excavation. And that means both the team and the information is slow and slow to return and often embargoed across the entire season. So they've begun to build digital tools that, that show the movement of information and, and physical objects throughout our systems and then reintegrate some of the people back into those systems. My area in this was in photogrammetry. And so we captured every one of our stratigraphic units with photograph photogrammetric uh, detail. Um, you're going to see much better photogrammetric work from other people, but for us, this was a really powerful tool. It allowed us to see our trenches, to kind of walk up and see things that we, uh, that we could otherwise see in person. But then once that trench was backfilled, we could get back in, look at features like uh, there's a, you, it's too dark, but there's a, a floor layer here. And then we could turn around and chase that floor layer in the other direction. What was powerful about doing this in this format was that we would use these photos with geo-referenced points. And by using these targets and the geo-referenced points, we're able to produce these ortho photos that look like this, that live in the real world. So that when we brought those into GIS and we drew over them, one of the things that we got was a, a, a polygon that represented a stratigraphic unit that was not just a representation in an abstract sense, but it lived in the real world and we didn't have to push it anywhere else. And we often had, as you can see, not exactly publication ready, but close to publication ready work. Now let me end on some of the labor here. The things I want to end on are some of the students. To do this work meant that we took dedicated personnel to the site and said, you are spatial specialists. Your entire job is to measure and map the trenches as the excavations happen. This means that that work is no longer with the excavators, right? This is our dedicated team to do that. It also meant, and I'm, I'm just gonna skip this for time, uh, uh, this is the, the failure of our hardware. This is a video card that failed in the field, uh, and I won't play the video because it's, it's, it may be if there's some sensitivities to, to strobe, that would be, I didn't realize that till just now. Um, but it meant that we were dependent on different types of hardware, and we became we became crippled by the absence of that hardware at the very end of the, of the project because we had to use less powerful hardware in order to run these processes. That's certainly a drawback to using some of these te digital technologies. The video I will play, however, is this one. 
which is a time-lapse photograph, a uh, time-lapse video of our, from a drone, of a person doing the photogrammetrical capture of this entire area, including not just the trench, but the wider area of the trench as well. And you'll see him move through this uh, as it goes around. But what I also want to point out is look where the other people are. They're not in the picture. This reorganization of labor has pushed the people who, do the, who used to do the work that you see Patrick doing out of the picture. And their labor is now being reoriented and redescribed to do more work to describe the stratigraphic unit, to do more work to sketch it and to draw it, to check the relationships. And if we can get there, to do more of the interpretive work that we want to do that says this stratigraphic unit belongs to this time and that's important so we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna spend the time figuring that out in the field. A lot of this has to do with pushing our, our scholarship towards publication um, rather than just trying to get it recorded. There's two things left with that. One, two things left to say. One is we went into the field with these ideas and they pretty much worked. But one of the things that we learned in terms of using the labor is that it's still not quite clear how we're supposed to use that new time, right? We've pushed archaeological field work in one direction, we've got new dedicated personnel, and then we have this lag time that we thought we would use in these certain ways for fines processing and reintegration and for better documentation from textual and visual information. And that's working, but only up to a point. That, that, that element of, of interpretation still requires that field supervisor. That they need her level of attention to do a lot of that work. And so we're still unsure what to do with that. The last thing that we're unsure about how to deal with is that in removing plans from our day-to-day -day, uh, transactions, we slow down the production of, of, of a, just a, a little representation of where a stratigraphic unit was, and we lag to a day uh, behind on some of those things. And some of the things that we have said is that, oh, well, you know, this, the 3D model stands in for that. We don't yet know how to share that across our project. It's both a question of the size of the files, the uh, ability to, tr to use these different types of files, and it's also, and this is where I want to kind of end, it's also a simple failure, maybe not a failure, it's a simple moment of the, of the lack of the ability to have the correct imagination of how these things are supposed to work. We're babies, we're infants in trying to use these things. We, speaking of ourselves, other people have been using them longer, but when we think about a digital model of a trench at a particular moment as a, as a piece of evidence for use in the field, for use out of the field and for use in publication, how do we actually use that to its fullest potential? And I don't think we have that realized yet. And so I want to leave you on that point because maybe some of you have good ideas, maybe some of you will be inspired to do your own things with that. Uh, and uh, I'll say thank you uh, from a pixelated Pompeii and, and thank you from a sunny Tharos. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Paylor. That was <coughs> a really fascinating journey into pixelated Pompeii. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to hand it over to the audience for questions. Um, Zach. Good morning, Professor. My name is Ana Cruz. I'm coming from Portugal, and I would like to know if you ever experience that kind of work in shelters or in small caves. No, um, I, I, I haven't. Um, I saw your, your poster yesterday, uh, and I, I, have a, a success, I have an idea of, of, of thinking about the kinds of things that, that you might, what might drive your question, uh, but I, I, I have to plead ignorance. Uh, I, don't have a, I don't have an example to work from. Um, maybe something will jar loose. I'm sorry to not have a better answer. 
<laughs> Call me in two years when my Getty when my when my Getty grants has run out. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, I noticed that you're um, uh, that when you're documenting the the uh, colonnade. Uh, you're documenting them in a relational database, and in light, we, in light of what you were saying earlier about the multitude of approaches um, that are thrown against the wall, and like the selection of tools that are that are um, chosen from like a, like a big variety of like an arsenal of other things that archaeologists you know select have 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 an opportunity to choose from. Um, I'm wondering how uh, how wh whether that was intentional or whether that was a, 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 a uh, a matter of, uh, of opportunity or circumstance, or and how um, how do you think things might have been different if you had chosen an alternative si recording system like a GIS, and whether you think about these things, mm -hmm. or or whether it's it's what, what just I'm wondering what your thoughts about about the how the tools are using. Uh, yeah, the origin yeah. stories of tools are are always complex, right? Um, I, I would say that. We uh, have invested in FileMaker for a number of reasons. Um, and the origin of that has as much to do with the fact that when we first started PhD work on Pompeii, one of the better tools available was FileMaker. Stephen Ellis, my, my, my constant named partner in, in all this, was doing his PhD research in, excuse me, in FileMaker. And I, was using GIS for a lot of my work on traffic systems in the ancient city. But I was using Access because I was using GIS. And back in the late 90s and early 2000s, the back end of a GIS geo database was an Access database. And you could go and have the same, you could have your, your geo database open in Access, build digital forms for that, and do data entry right directly into the back end of your of your geo database and have it appear in the map, right? It sometimes crashed because you were you know, kind of messing with it, but that was a really great solution. I was super happy to work between these two these two things. But the big the big transformation and the big change really happened at the point of the iPad coming out, because there was a client called FileMaker Go, for FileMaker that allowed us to make things in FileMaker and push them to iPads very easily. And that simplicity is what made the difference there. I'll add, I'll add one other example of that, which is I used ArcGIS because it was what I knew about back, back way back when. And way back when, I didn't have the money for a license for Esri products back in 2003, 2004. So I would go, what, what I did have money for is I would buy the tutorial books that came with a CD with a six months license. And I would buy two of those a year. And that's how I would keep up with ArcGIS. But there's no good reason now that I have the resources to continue that from, for these Pompeii works, other than I have invested a lot of time and energy into myself to be able to use that product. And my university uses that and has a huge Uber license for that, and they support it at, at our institution. So this technology is not necessarily the best for everything, but it is deeply the most convenient uh, in those ways. So that's the, the story of how we've done those things. Do we think that there are better ways of doing things? Absolutely. And in fact, some of the work that we did at Tharos this summer required me to get to know a little bit of QGIS in order to work with some of these really large files. And I was very happy with that. Let me push it one step further to say that the process of moving our polygons out of GIS and then sharing them with our FileMaker database is a process of translating them to GeoJSON. And Chris and I, in particular, Chris Motz and I in particular, have dreamed about this notion that if we're kind of atomizing them, our, our spatial objects down to a text level, there's very little stopping us from kind of publishing in real time these kinds of things, right? That we're already we're getting down to that atomic publication level uh, very quickly as part of our work process. Why not add one more layer and have a kind of watch us dig in real time if through a leaflet a application or something like that? Um, but we haven't done that yet, and that has more to do with time and a small amount to do with uh, who owns what and when we own things. That, that there's 
plenty of issues to talk about there, but thank you for your question. Hi, thank you so much for an incredibly interesting talk. Um, so I had a question about the what looks like a really good resource. The, is it Pompeian photographs? Is Pompeian that, pictures. Pompeian yeah. pictures. So um, the fact that you've chosen to just link through to that resource, and it seems like it's become quite an integral part of what your the work that you're doing, makes an assumption of persistence mm -hmm. for that resource. Absolutely. But you said that this is a retired couple that are doing this sort of on their own time. So, and, and I'm assuming that you are one of a whole community of scholars that probably use this resource. Mm -hmm. So have you started the conversation with them about what is going to happen to that resource once they are no longer able to maintain it? Yes. Uh, great question. Uh, you have to do nothing but go and click around in the Pompeii Quadroporticus Project's website and find dead links to a project I'm still working on. Link rot is, is impacting things that I'm all still doing. Um, we have had that conversation and you know more, more and more credit to pile on to Bob and Jackie. They approached me saying, you know, hey, we're worried that we're not going to be around forever to maintain this, and what happens when we can't, what happens with all these things. And as part of the uh, Pompeii Artistic Landscape Project, so if you go to Pompeii Pictures now, you'll see web versions of these images. And they're small, downsampled versions of the pictures that they have at higher resolution, because the agreement with the Pompeii Superintendency back 15 years ago was that we don't want to have anything online that someone could download and then publish, because they have rights restrictions on publication and fees that they impose, and other, other elements of cu cultural patrimony that they want to, they want to protect. So Bob and Jackie have all these large-scale photos offline. They, as part of this PALP project, I said, listen, I would love to use your higher resolution ones because then I'd be able to see the things that we're trying to describe better. And they said, sure, that's a great idea. We just need to make sure that we maintain the, the protection of those and they don't go online. I said, absolutely. But what if we could get them online? What if we could you know, convince the superintendency, which has now changed several times since the, their original agreement, and, and there's a beginning shift in some of the culture of their understanding of how they want to interact with digital, digital works. Uh, and the new superintendent is largely open to these things, and we've begun a negotiation. Uh, I won't characterize it any more than, uh, than uh, I had a chance encounter with Professor Rosanna on a Greek island this summer where we had just happened to be on vacation to the same place. Uh, and we realized in the, you know, over an Uzo that we had lots in common in ways of, of outlook. And he described to me, the, I described to him this process as yes, but what, I'm what he says, what I'm concerned about is that some of these photos don't make the site look good. You know, we, these are just tourist photos. They're blurry. They're, there's ongoing excavation or things like that. So we're in the process, this is the long answer to your question, I'm sorry. We're in the process of taking all 512 or so, uh, 515 gigabytes of high resolution images. We're processing them. We're using some machine learning uh, and, and computer vision to begin to parse those. And eventually, we want to make them all available as individual high resolution images within the University of Massachusetts uh, Digital Scholarship Services, Digital Scholarship Center, which, has, which was originally our image library. So we hope to have a transition by which we have a much more stabilized version of those, of those pictures housed within a library that then becomes the resource that we point to. I hope that was a satisfying answer. And, and just before Matt closes things down, I, I know I've run over time and I, I have, I've taken some of your questions away from you. So I'm very open to talk to questions, more questions in, in, in uh, coffee hour and other times like that. So I appreciate your time and indulgence. Thanks.